Ladies and gentlemen, good morning from Dublin, from the European Commission representation. Welcome to the annual State of the Euro European Union Address 2023. My name is John O'Brennan. I'm a professor at Maynooth University, specializing in European integration. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome everybody to this morning's event, those of us who are here in the room and to those of you who are joining us online. This morning's event is co-organized by the Irish Institute for International and European Affairs, by the Commission representation in Ireland, and by the European Parliament Liaison Office. Before we begin, let me just briefly run through the running order. I'll firstly introduce each of our distinguished speakers, and in approximately five minutes or so, we will go live to President von der Leyen's address. The president is due to speak for approximately 45 minutes, perhaps a little bit longer. And once she has concluded, we will come back to our expert panel to get insights from each of them. There'll also be an opportunity for people in the audience to ask questions and make comments. And for those of you who are joining us online, you can do similarly by using the Zoom function Q&A button, which is on you will find on the bottom of your screen. With that, then, let me formally introduce our panel. On my left, Lisa Chambers is a Fianna Fáil senator. Lisa is a former TD for Mayo, and I suspect possibly a future TD for Mayo, and was first elected to Castlebar Municipal District Council in the local elections in 2014. She is leader of Shannad Aaron and the Fianna Fáil group in the Shannad, she is party spokesperson on European and foreign affairs and is chair of the Shannon's Brexit Committee. She's a barrister by profession. She holds a master's degree from uh, UCD in law and professional barrister in law from the King's Inns. She's also a former member of the Reserve Defence Force, having attained the rank of second lieutenant and is a passionate advocate for the Irish Defence Forces. Good morning and welcome, Lisa. Catherine Day, our second guest this morning, was Secretary General of the European Commission for 10 years between 2005 and 2015. She was the first woman and the second Irish person to hold that post. She worked in the past in the cabinets of Dick Burke, Peter Sutherland, and Leon Britton. And at an earlier point in time, uh, worked intensively on the enlargement of the EU to Eastern Europe, a topic I'm sure that's going to be central to President von der Leyen's address this morning. In 2002, she was promoted to Director General of DG Environment uh, before she becomes Secretary General of the Commission in 2005. Welcome, Catherine, and thanks for being here. Our final speaker this morning is Dan O'Brien. Dan is the chief economist at the IIEA. He is also an adjunct senior research fellow at UCD and one of Ireland's most prominent commentators on economic and public policy issues. For three years from mid 2010, Dan was the economics editor of the Irish Times, analyzing and commenting on a wide range of Irish, European and global issues. Prior to that, he spent a dozen years based in London and Geneva, as senior economist and editor at the Economist Intelligence Unit, and previously has worked for the European Commission as a consultant also for the UN and a number of other bodies. Thanks very much indeed, Dan, for joining us. Now we're still waiting for President von der Leyen to uh, begin her speech. If I might sort of open proceedings, Dan, by asking you to set the scene for us. Could you perhaps say something about the European economy, where we are today versus a year ago? Thanks, John, and uh, thank you. it's good to be here. Um, I think we cast our minds back 12 months ago. We were facing an extremely, in fact, one of the most uncertain times in, in my professional career. It was the, the prospect of energy shortages over the winter. Uh, inflation was, was high and rising. Uh, interest rates were responding. Uh, these were all extreme headwinds to, to economic growth. And we had just, we were coming out of the pandemic period. So an extraordinary period of 
uh, uncertainty. The president of the European very, Commission. Very plausible uh, case to say that we would have suffered a very deep recession last year. Yeah. Where are we today? The European economy is bigger today than it was this time last year, marginally. And unemployment mm -hmm. is either low or stable in nearly every member state. So in the past, we've had periods of jobless growth. In this case, we have full employment semi-stagnation. Now, that's a pretty good place to be, given the headwinds we've faced mm -hmm. and all things considered. So I think it's, it's the glass three quarters full, uh, particularly given where we were 12 months ago. Yeah. Um, Catherine, very briefly, what do you expect to hear from President von der Leyen today? What do you think is going to be at the core of the State of the Union speech? Well, I think that this is um, her last State of the Union speech in the current Commission. Um, so I think there'll be a look back at what has been achieved. And we forget too easily just how uh, well Europe has done in the last five years in the face of a pandemic, a war, energy crisis, uh, inflation, etc. But also, um, there are a lot of open issues which are difficult for Europe to resolve. So I expect her to talk about enlargement, climate, I have a little checklist of 10 things here, so I'm going to check them off as I'm sure she will raise them. Um, so it will be really taking the temperature of where we are, what, what has led up to this day, but also a look ahead. Mm -hmm. And Lisa, for you, what are you expecting to see from the Commission President this morning? Yeah, I think because it's her final State of the Union address before uh, her term comes to an end and we don't know yet what her plans are for the next term, I certainly hope she'll be going forward for a second term. You would expect her to talk about legacy, what's been achieved. I think she's had an incredibly difficult term, a global pandemic, uh, energy crisis, um, which was severe. And obviously now the largest number of displaced persons uh, since World War II in terms of the war in Ukraine. So I think her legacy will be one of stability, one of, of steering the ship steadily through all of those crises. And actually... I think she might be taking to the yes. state very soon. In just under 300 days. Well, thank you very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen. We're now going to turn to discussion of what I think you'll agree was an extraordinarily substantive speech. All of the big challenges that Europe faces collectively and the kinds of things that the Commission is doing to try and address those challenges. I'm going to turn initially to each of our speakers in reverse order to give us their impressions of the speech. I'll begin with you, Lisa, if I could. What for you were the standout things in von der Leyen's speech? Yeah, I mean, I think she she hit on the topics we expected her to touch upon, uh, enlargement, legacy, migration, climate. Um, but there were a couple of, there were, there were two areas for me that stood out. Uh, clearly she was quite forthright and strong in her comments on China uh, and Russia. And I think that that needs to continue. Um, and I was very glad to see that once she started her speech talking about the next generation and young people, I think that's really important, um, that we we are aspirational in our future, uh, talks for what we want the union to look like. And her focus then, um, not for the first time, on critical raw materials, how we protect ourselves from being vulnerable. Um, she did this in last year's speech as well and in the previous year also, uh, talking about um, you know, making sure that we're not reliant on one country for the supply of critical raw materials. Uh, so when she focused on uh, tackling China, for example, on their domestic policy in relation to electric vehicles, that's really important. Um, so th things like chips, how we ensure that these critical technologies and raw materials are produced in Europe and not only produced in Europe, that we have deals with other like-minded nations beyond our, our, our European borders to ensure that we have, have that supply. I think that was really important and secondly, then her conversation, her comments around uh, artificial intelligence, I think is really, um, really welcome. Uh, I think there's a lot of concern around that area. There's a lot of misinformation uh, and that is uh, so it's going to continue because of it. But also, I think uh, her suggestion that we have an IPCC like organization to deal with AI, I think was practical and really interesting. So AI and critical materials for me were the two areas I think were, were interesting and future looking. Um, and I think they were really welcome. So I can say that within the university system, we have been completely preoccupied with AI and how it's already accelerating change in all kinds of ways, just within our sector. Catherine, if I could turn to you, your impressions. Um, I thought it was a very confident, polished, sure-footed political speech. 
the way these things are put together is there's a big troll across the political parties, the member states, interest groups, etc. Everybody, it's like, like the budget here, everybody has their request. I think she ticked a lot of boxes on a lot of people's lists. Um, but I think she did it in a way, I was interested in the way she counterbalanced. So um, a lot of messages are there to reassure people. But what I what I thought was very impressive was the way that she has linked dossiers together across, like I thought she showed great mastery uh, of how to put things together. And it was a very um, strong message that a geopolitical Europe can be successful. Um, and uh, I think she uh, put the emphasis on unity, confidence that we can change and the message that we need to change and we need to start now. So uh, what I found very interesting as a former commission official was she certainly continues to position the commission as the player uh, in, the, in the process that has the ideas that will reach out. And so she's not afraid to tackle difficult issues. Like she did tackle the issue of agriculture and climate mm -hmm. pretty directly, and she's proposing to talk and to listen. And I think that's that will resonate here, I hope, but it also resonates in her own political party with the EPP uh, line on all of this. Again, on enlargement, which I think is going to be a huge challenge. Um, I think she's right to say we have to seize the moment. We have to do the right thing for history. That's what we have always done. But she's also positioning the commission with all its processes to take over uh, quite a lot to, to do the negotiating, to take over the running of it. Because again, member states, parliament will blow hot and cold on the political mood, whereas the commission will have to deliver it. Um, and so it needs to be steady. It needs to be objective. It needs to have uh, it, its technical expertise available. Um, and she, she ha I mean, she, ta ta she ticked between eight and a half and nine of the boxes on my list. Um, but one that she kind of underplayed, but one where she has been very confident is on funding. If you think of how often Europe is bedeviled with budget, she has shown in her time that the, she can get uh, the union to think much more creatively about how to fund itself. We're she was ripping off figures of 50 billion, 12 billion uh, in ways that rarely you would ever hear a commission president uh, speak. So I thought it was a, a kind of a masterclass in how to bring a lot of people on board, um, but at the same time without dodging the difficult issues. So if you ask me, was it a job application? I would say yes. <laughs> Dan, finally to you, what are your main takeaways from the speech? Well, there's certainly uh, lots there, but maybe talk about the external economic relations of the, of the EU and that's something about the domestic competitiveness agenda. So there was a line, we see a clear attempt by some to return to block thinking, trying to isolate and influence countries in between. So I think that's sort of reflective of, of the effective end of the multilateral trading system, as we've known in recent decades, a much more complex system to be, uh, system to be navigated for Europe. There was the Critical Raw Materials Club. There was the Global Gateway Initiative. That's basically an, an attempt to, to work or at least push back against Chinese, the Chinese Belt and Road. Um, De-risk, not decouple, a heavy emphasis on China, which I thought was, was good and correct, that de-risk, not decouple line. People may remember the uh, Polish Minister of Foreign Affairs used exactly that same term. It seems to be this sort of the, the term we Europeans are using vis-a-vis -vis China. There was some teeth there as well, the anti-subsidy investigation e-vehicles from China. I think that's a significant signal uh, that Europe isn't going to take um, sort of unfair competition lying down anymore and a signal to China. Was very surprised. I don't think the United States was mentioned once. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was it? Mm, once, it once, once. Once. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that was good in one way, because I, I feel over the past year, there's been far too much focus on US subsidies. So the Chinese have been doing much more over a much longer period of time using subsidies, and we haven't really done much about it, whereas the US started doing it and everyone almost lost their reason. And there was, you know, in my view, excessive criticism of the US for, for use of subsidies. Um, so I, it was good to see that it was the focus on China rather than the US. The US is obviously our most important strategic partner. It's our most important trade partner. Um, so good that there wasn't any criticism of the US. On the other hand, from an Irish perspective in particular, that transatlantic relations is so important. The the the, the absence of focus on partnership with the United States, uh, something would be slightly concerning. Um, and just, very, do I have time? Yeah, I just want to ask you, um, 
is there some kind of contradiction there between the need for a muscular industrial strategy to compete with China and the United States and subsidies and how you maintain the integrity of the single market? How do those two things move? Well, it, so I don't think the single market was mentioned once. Mm. Was, was the single market mentioned? No, no. Not uh, I don't think basically. industrial policy was mentioned, which is now back it in was, vogue. It was. It was, okay. I missed that. <laughs> and state aid regime. I don't think state aids uh, were mentioned. So I, it just, we're, we're living in an entirely new world now where the old idea of sort of, you know, free markets largely doing the heavy lifting and governments in, intervening on, on the side, that really has changed, you know, not only in terms of, of policy, but I think in the economics profession as well, there's a sort of new, that e era of, uh, you know, liberalization, free trade, minimal government intervention is changing. And for Europe, given the basis of, of, of our, of the way the single market has worked, of anti-state aid, uh, level playing field. That puts the whole European model, you know, it, it, it kind of, how does the European model adapt to that? I'm not saying, you know, industrial policy is wrong. I'm not saying it's right. There are areas where it clearly works. But, but for Europe to navigate that, to maintain a level playing field in the single market internally, to use it in a way that if we do use industrial policy, that it doesn't go to the bigger countries that they gain and smaller countries such as ourselves then lose out because the investments go to the bigger countries with, with maybe the greater capacity. So I've really complicated both externally focusing and within the single market and how the single market works itself. Really complicated things happening, many, many little cogs changing and moving and big ones too. Uh, so a very complicated world out there. Um, Lisa, if I could turn to you, um, the president began by talking about young people, but also about the European Parliament elections next year. And as somebody whose party will be going into those elections mm -hmm. and campaigning, um, do you see danger ahead? The, the sense that the center of gravity within the European Union has moved a bit to the right? that there may well be an alliance between the European People's Party and the ECR, or even Identity Europe, or there's going to be a resurgence of support for far-right parties across the Union. And how does the European Parliament look, and how, how might the whole way in which Europe processes legislation, if we end up with an even more fragmented Parliament and one where the far right is in a significantly stronger position than it's in today. Yeah, I mean, that's a, how do I answer that in terms of our European elections here will be primarily focused on domestic issues. Um, but it is important, I think what you're getting at, John, in, in maybe in one line is that it matters who we send to Europe. Mm. And that's a message that we need to get out for our elections next year, that we are sending people that represent our country well, that actually are positive, constructive, um, are voting in a manner that is representative of the people that elect them, and that they are voting in Ireland's best interests. And currently that's not happening with all of our MEPs. If I can, I can say that because I'm political, obviously, and I'm part of a political party. Um, so that, that will certainly be, be my message and my party's message that it matters who you send to Europe. Um, because we have a small team, but we've always been a very effective team working with our, um, our I suppose, the, the, not just the politicians, but the entire team that Ireland sends out there and those that are based in Brussels as well. Um, where our politics is still quite middle ground. We don't really have a far right or the hard left. It's still quite middle ground. Um, but those issues, I think when it comes to the elections, you will see things like migration for the first time really becoming an issue in Ireland. Mm -hmm. I think that will be a topic for the elections next year. Agriculture will be a, a key topic because it always is. And I think what Catherine was saying about uh, it was good to see the Commission President directly deal with that yeah. and say that we will have a dialogue and we will discuss, um, you know, putting together our vision for the future of agriculture, yeah. uh, about good food production, but also protecting incomes. Uh, and, I, and I do think that, you know, when it comes to, to the elections next year, I was surprised actually that there, was, there wasn't much commentary in her speech about defence. Mm -hmm. That's quite Hardly topical any. here. Hardly. Yeah. She did mention the EU Defence Union, yeah. um, which in whatever way you interpret that means different things to different member states. And, and that's fine. That's OK. Uh, but defence, I think, uh, will, is always a topic for discussion here when we discuss Europe. Mm -hmm. So I think that will be an issue as well. And yeah. as always, you will have those on 
leaning more to the right and those leaning more to the left that will try and exploit people's yeah. fears and anxieties around those key issues. Catherine, turning to the European Green Deal, uh, Ursula von der Leyen made this a central plank of her commission's agenda starting out in 2019. Um, I think it's fair to say that if we look back at the Nature Restoration Act, the debates that took place within the Council and the Parliament, and what many perceived to be a suboptimal piece of legislation or one that was watered down because it was very difficult to sell, particularly for the EPP. If we look at the debate about air quality that's going on currently, um, how do you assess the Commission's performance on the European Green Deal relative to where we were four years ago? Um, I think it's it's always difficult because politics is the art of compromise and uh, the Commission fights its corner very hard on these kind of issues where there's real commitment and where I think we're lucky to have a Commission that can take a 20 and 30 year horizon uh, towards a goal, but it has to zigzag with public opinion, changes of government, etc. And one of my former bosses used to say in moments of crisis negotiation, well, I'd rather have legislation on the statute book than the perfect theoretical solution. So it is about knowing when to compromise and when not. What I, I think she had the Green Deal with working, I mean, obviously the commission never works alone, but I think it has moved the dial. Um, and what it has done is to give a focal point, you know, very, very clear on 2030. So there's time for people to move. We have to race because we were slow starters mm -hmm. here in Ireland. But she has also managed to find ways to um, mobilize more energy um, in, in terms of political energy, but also uh, funding from the private sector by setting a horizon. Um, it was interesting what she said on wind today. I think that we haven't commented on that yet, but she has effectively picked up on the two problems that we have here, uh, planning and auctions. Mm -hmm. Now, it'll be very interesting to see what the Commission is going to do about it. But I think probably it is a wise decision if we are, if we are going to rely on new renewables in the future, perhaps to lift it up to the European level, because we're not the only ones facing uh, the political and the public questioning that's going on, the how to, where, but if it's lifted up to a broader plane and seen to be part of a wider movement, perhaps it can unlock some of the solutions that are stuck at national level. So I think it shows a deft hand and an intelligent focus on issues that can move the dial. Um, but it's um, we haven't really yet as a society accepted that it's going to change the way that we live our lives. And I think that's we have to reach out to people. We have to embrace them. It's easier with the young generation. And she was quite right to put quite a lot of emphasis on them. I think they get it more than some of us who are stuck in our ways and comfortable. Yeah. Um, but I think we it, it, this is what Europe does well for its member states is to do the forward thinking, map things out. And then, as I say, go in a zigzag, but reach the goal. Dan, just turning to the economy again and linking it to one of the other big issues that the president highlighted, which was migration, she cited some extraordinary statistics, and I must admit that I wasn't aware of some of them, that, for example, three quarters of SMEs in Europe have a skills shortage. They're looking for workers. All over the continent, there are shortages of different kinds. And the obvious answer to this is migration policy, that you can bring people in from outside and you can fill those gaps. But there is such opposition in many member states to the notion of much inward migration. How does the Commission square that dilemma, that kind of problem? Because this is not going to get any better because of the effects of displacement from climate change and other reasons, we're going to see many, many more people wanting to come to Europe. And at the level of the council, migration policy is a complete mess. Yeah, well, I think it's also important when we talk about migration to differentiate between work permits that are granted to bring skilled people in and people who are coming looking for asylum. So these are two entirely different forms of migration. I think it's very important from an economic, certainly from every perspective, but from an economic perspective, uh, that they are very different. Um, she had a good line in there saying, instead of millions of people looking for jobs, millions of jobs are looking for people. Now, you know, as she said, and um, you know, if you had come asked me three years ago when we were sort of still in the emergency phase of the pandemic, that as you say, businesses all over Europe would have labor shortages. You know, I thought we'd be in exactly the opposite position. Now we're not out of the woods yet. Yeah. You know, 
there are tremors, you know, in the European economy that mean, you know, suggest we could have a recession this year. If we do, you know, those labor shortage problems will be will be eased. So I don't think we can assume that forever more in the future, we are going to have full employment in Europe. That hasn't been the case over the past 30 or 40 years. Hopefully, that is the new phase we're entering into. But I certainly wouldn't take it for granted. Yeah, and there's still big differences. In Spain, for example, unemployment is still over 12%. Well, I, I, that, that's one of the, you know, the, the new social partners summit that she mentioned. Yeah. Uh, you know, I really, you know, labor market outcomes in member states are determined by what happens in member states it's not really an eu function yeah. so I, I you know i'm at the value of these this sort of social partner so much fine you know it can be of some use but in terms of determining labor market outcomes in member states it really will have no impact because precisely as you say you have you know very different employment rates very different unemployment rates very different niche rates this this uh not an unemployment education or training that she mentioned across the block and that's because it's not eu regulation laws that yeah. determine labor outcomes it's national ones yeah. Yeah, we're going to turn in a few minutes to questions from the audience. So anybody who has a question that you'd like to ask, uh, perhaps you would just line it up in your mind and get it ready. Those of you who are online, questions are coming in on Zoom and we'll get to those. But one final question for the panel, which is about Ukraine. One of the most touching moments I thought in the speech was when she mentioned the Ukrainian writer, Victoria Amelina, who was one of the victims of Russian brutality earlier this year. It got, I think, the loudest round of applause uh, in the chamber when she talked about her. Um, Catherine, do you think that the European Union is going to be able to maintain its unity on Ukraine as we go forward? There are all kinds of challenges, potentially the reconstruction of Ukraine is going to be enormously costly financially. And that links then to enlargement and the cost of enlargement. The commission president in the last third first speech really devoted it all to enlargement. Some of that was about what the European Union needs to do. Charles Michel at the Bled Security Summit a few weeks ago in Slovenia, he said the EU should be ready by 2030. But do you, do you have any indication that the Commission has the tools to be able to do that kind of preparatory work, and will the member states allow them to do it? Because one of the most disturbing things about the enlargement process over the last 15 years and the stagnation of it was the way in which member states keep objecting to a particular candidate state and preventing any progress being made by that state. Hungary this week has already threatened to block Ukraine if it doesn't insert right a, a clause into its constitution Hungarian. on the Hungarian population. So just on the overall issue about enlargement and Ukraine, does the EU have the capacity to really do the planning necessary to get us to a point where we'll have another European day of welcomes? I love the way she referenced actually what took place in Dublin in 2004. Um, yes, we absolutely do have the capacity. We are rich, we have clever people, and we don't have much option. Because if we don't answer that call, what's the answer? That the Putin continues to nibble away at the eastern side of the European Union, that we give in to this kind of tyranny and dictatorship? So yes, we absolutely have the capacity. Will it be easy? Absolutely not. And that's what I meant about the zigzag, because every member state will have issues with different parts of this journey. But having seen it done several times, yeah. I know it's possible. I personally don't like the idea of attaching a date. Yeah. We attached a date to Bulgaria and Romania in accession, and then we were only able to delay it by one year, and they were not ready to join. But we've made it work since. But there are still hangovers. I don't know if people, how many people picked up when she talked about Bulgaria and Romania and Schengen. But I mean, they've been years knocking on the gate. They've been technically ready for years. And she still had to say, now is the moment to do it. So there will be all those reversals, but they won't stop <clears throat> the general direction of travel. Um, and I think it will cost more. It will be more difficult. Just think, just think about revising the CAP to include a country the size of Ukraine with its yeah. enormous capacity. But we, we are doomed anyway if we're not able to embrace this kind of change. And I do think this is where the union can be at its best. And I do think that... We have learned in the hard years of, of her 
mandate um, through the pandemic, through the Russian aggression, through the energy crisis, that we have to work together and we have to find compromises. And I think there, there is a certain, the union is slightly better at it now than it was 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I absolutely believe it's possible, but I absolutely believe it will be hell. And, uh, but at the same time, a younger me would love to go back and be involved in this next succession process because I think it was one of the most exciting things yeah. I did in my career. She did point out that over the last 20 years, the EU went through something very similar. I mean, the issues with Poland, for yeah. example, very similar, same size population. They're not finished. Still having problems. Still there. Yeah. economy and so forth. Absolutely. Even we can be difficult sometimes. Oh, yes. <laughs> I note that the commissioner also mentioned the probability of treaty change, something that strikes fear, fear into the heart yeah. of every Irish politician. But, but if, I can, if I can say, I, I underlined the language because she said, if and when needed. Yeah. And I think that's the right way to do it. Do what you absolutely what you can in the existing treaty. If you find you can't, then it's easy to explain to people why you can't. Yes, but don't start with treaty change, please. Yeah. yeah. OK, we're going to open the session to questions. I'll take three at a time, and if you could kindly identify yourself and your affiliation, if any. Thanks. And I should say that although I come from Maynooth, I am not a great fan of sermons, so could you <laughs> please deliver a concise and efficient question rather than a sermon. Thanks. I'll try not to fill those My name is Johnny. My name is Johnny Ryan from ICCL. I this is a question for Catherine in particular. The president was speaking to a, a room full of MEPs who are probably terrified that they won't be there after the next election. And they're all probably thinking that social media and digital is part of the reason why they're having that fear. Were you not surprised, or is it that it's, it's back of the agenda? We didn't hear a joined up vision for the problems of social media. There was a little bit about the DSA, which won't solve the problem. There was nothing really about the competition issues, which loomed large. There wasn't really anything, even in AI, about the workforce working for algorithms, which will grow, nothing about carbon and digital, and nothing about security and digital, really. So is that off the agenda a bit at the moment, that joint of vision? Thanks very much indeed, Johnny. Um, a second question. Ambassador. Thank yes. you, Vincent Yaron, the French ambassador. I concur with you saying that it was a very inspired speech with a quite obvious source of inspiration in certain cases. But my question is on um, uh, the SME. She mentioned uh, SME envoy. Uh, I recollect that a few years ago there was already a SME envoy in the present, in the was the uh, former uh, chief minister of um, Bavaria, Mr. Stoiber, quite a high figure. So m uh, my question is a bit ironical. How confident are we that? We can reduce uh, uh, yeah. kind of the burden on this ME because we know what it means. It means tackling environmental law, tackling many uh, rules like this on impact environment. So, how much is this uh, realistic, and uh, have we done not done this before? And I suppose does it also contradict the ambition of the green agenda? That's a really important question. Yes, John. John Fitzgerald Trinity College, having grown up or were, lived through the single European market era, her emphasis on industrial policy, without explaining how that will be reconciled with the interests of the single market, um, concerned me. And I wonder what how Dan sees it. She particularly mentioned solar and EVs and the interests of Southern Europe who have that made major progress, for example, in Spain on decarbonizing has been the price of solar panels have been driven way down. EVs, they're being rolled out much more rapidly than uh, anticipated. And if China chooses to subsidize Europe's greening, why should we worry when parts of Europe will benefit? So has the issue of industrial policy and how it is reconciled with the single market been worked out, um, Dan? And I would also add that if we look at subsidies, some member states like Germany, for example, are in a much, much better position to provide really large subsidies to particular industries or businesses. And that in itself might have a fragmenting or distorting effect on the single market. Dan. So the, the short answer to the question is how, how, how have we got industrial policy in the single market 
knitted together, uh, not at all. Uh, I think it'll take years for us to intellectually to, to work out a way where the state aids regime may be adapted, uh, what sort of subsidies work. You know, will the US subsidies work? You know, the idea that this is going to lead to a, a, a renaissance, a manufacturing renaissance in the United States, it might do, but we don't know. You know, we, we know that these sort of subsidies regimes in the past have ended up being wasteful. So the idea that, you know, suddenly industrial subsidization of industries is going to be successful, we know that it may not be. We know that there, there, there have been examples of success in East Asia, Latin America, it's, it's mostly been a disaster. So we just don't know. And I think it'll take years for us, you know, in terms of intellectually and legislatively to knit those two together. Just on the SME thing, uh, you, you know, I think it was welcomed that there was this 25% reduction in, 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 in what was it, uh, reporting obligations and, and focused on regulatory, regulatory impact assessment, uh, bringing Draghi in to, to report like clearly a real heavy weight so that will have some uh, some impact. But this idea of SME envoys at, a, at an EU level, I just, I think it's, it's, it's a fig leaf, it's meaningless. Yeah. That's right. on, on the social media question, I mean, I think the obvious thing to say is this is a, a speech at a high level of generality, so you, you can't be looking for details here. She would have been three weeks at the podium had she given the necessary detail. But I did pick up that she says our number one priority is to ensure AI develops in a human centric, transparent and responsible way. And this is something new we're all tackling, but I think what Europe has done and, and is leading the way on is to show that it's not something that we should be subject to. We should set out to harness it and master it and deal with the consequences. So it's very early stages. I think a lot of work is obviously going on on it. Um, and she has shown that Europe will defend itself on these terms, but also wants to reach out to the rest of the world and work with them. So as to how can we tackle um the to get the benefits out of something new without the disadvantages that's all i can say because i don't think the work is more developed than that i agree with dan that i, I mean i've seen i don't know how many sme envoys i've seen it sounds like a great idea but it must be frustrating for them you know they come in full of ideas and realize that it's much more difficult um having worked with mr stoiber myself um it is it is very difficult to get people to say, to take what works at one national level and say, let's Europeanize it. That doesn't work. You know, you have to make a different European approach. Um, I think it's good to have, uh, to be very aware of the burden of regulation. I think we can still do more to sit, to go back to old regulation and simplify, but um, we need a pact, which we tried to get in my time and didn't get. Um, there are very old pieces of legislation that everybody admits should be overhauled, but uh, the Commission is afraid to open them, because if it does, it, the progress that they achieved will be rolled back, uh, because you have more countries now, different member states who didn't make the original bargain, and the member states in Parliament were never prepared to give a commitment not to touch the ambition of the of the old legislation just to update the mechanisms. So that that's a real stumbling block. Um, but I, I do think having invested heavily on um, better regulation, that we need to keep investing in better regulation. But we have to take out of this the poison of the UK, because that was their mantra, you know, two out for everyone in like mechanistic things, which they didn't abide by themselves. And I have to say, I was very interested when the UK air traffic melted down. The BBC was saying, well, you will get compensation because this is a leftover from when we were in the EU. Well, thanks that they had the leftover, you know. So for everybody who objects to a piece of legislation, there's somebody who wants it. So we have to be cognizant of the impact. I think we can do more, but it's not a nirvana either. And if you're a small company that wants to export without any um, letter hindrance to 26 other countries, then you have to accept that there's a certain you have to adapt to some extent. So there's lots that can be done, but envoys and numbers don't work in my experience. Lisa. Yeah, just on a couple of points. Uh, Johnny, she did mention um, about being a global leader in digital rights. So I do think she did hint at wanting to, to focus on that issue, but didn't provide the details. Um, but that's definitely on the agenda. And just, John, in relation to your, your point, I think when she spoke about China and the impact of the EVs coming into our market, she really honed in on the impact that that had on, on, on our own indigenous businesses, that it killed off 
some really new and innovative businesses and took them out of the market because of those big subsidies. So I think if we want people in, in Europe and our own business people and young people coming through in that area to be innovators and researchers and develop new technologies, um, if the competition, if the market isn't fair, we won't have that. So it's about developing our own domestic industries within, within Europe to make sure that we're not reliant on China because we need EVs and other technologies. Before I go back to the audience in the room, there's a question on Zoom from Michael Healy of the Central Bank of Ireland, open to anybody on the panel. The EU is a rules-based system. How should the European Union deal with what um, Michael calls rogue administrations such as Hungary, which ignore European law on public procurement legislation, for example, as well as exhibiting significant levels of corruption, including alleged misappropriation of European Union funds, those kind of problems related to the rule of law. The Commissioner, the Commission President mentioned them in respect of enlargement, but just in the broader sense, how is the EU doing on rule of law issues, do you think? Uh, I think it's been quite weak in terms of tackling clear breaches of rule of law. Uh, Poland and Hungary obviously jumped to mind. Uh, it is a does cutting off funding in certain streams is, is, is the, the only tool really in the toolbox. And I think that's been happening to a certain extent in dialogue. And, you know, it, it is a challenge. And I think it builds resentment in other member states who are doing the right thing. Um, if those that break the rules are not, if there are no consequences. So it is important to tackle it, but it's not an easy one to tackle when somebody's already in the club. Yeah. Um, but they are trying to do that through sanctions. And Catherine, it is very difficult genuinely for the Commission, isn't it, as a body that is supposed to represent the European interest, because if it intervenes too heavily in one member states, it provides grist to the mill of populist leaders mm -hmm. who can trot out the anti-European line. But on rule of law reports that the Commission now delivers annually, do you think they are making a difference? Um, well, first of all, I agree with Lisa. I think we've been too weak and we've been too slow to move. It has to do also with the European political families, um, the Poland and Hungary being in certain groups. They, the group then supports them and that spreads out to the other institutions as well. So, I, And I think it has cost us in terms of the image of are we a union that defends our values or not? And I think it plays particularly badly with younger people. So I, I'm glad that action has been taken. It's always better late than never. And I, we have to stick to our guns now. Um, we can't now start to give in and write special deals for Hungary or Poland um, as we come, because they are facing financial difficulties because they were counting on this money. So we have to stick to our principles. The rule of law reports are useful. Um, because they give you a kind of objective basis um, uh, on which to argue and to discuss. Um, and there's no country that can't improve. Um, and the smart ones use it as an outsider, as, as a sort of friendly outsider look and see what, what we can do to improve. Um, and I think um, they will also, the fact that she wants to open them to some of the candidates, I think is good to get them into the way that the European Union does look at what happens in member states because that's the bargain um they agree lots of things every time they meet but uh, then they have to go home and implement them afterwards and if they don't go home and implement there have to be consequences because otherwise you can't enjoy all the benefits of no borders no controls etc um it has to be it's not a totally level playing field but it has to be perceived as a mainly level playing field so i think it is important but i, I think it's also important um to say that once you're in the family and most European countries look on it as being in a family, then they will go to quite extraordinary lengths to keep that yeah. country or group yeah. in the family. And I mean, we benefited enormously from the strong European solidarity throughout the whole Brexit saga and still do because we are in the family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think all three of the really big political groups, they all have members that are problematic in mm -hmm. respect to rule of law in one way or another. Uh, yes, there's a gentleman just here with the glasses. Thank you. Uh, Brian Daly, a uh, member of the Institute. Um, I'd just be interested in the panel's uh, views on the, um, in the context of the unprecedented uh, circumstances we're in, in the context of the war in Ukraine. 
and Russian aggression, there was no reference or appreciation for the input from the United States or the UK in providing military support. There was a lot of reference to the humanitarian support that the EU has provided to Ukrainian people, uh, but there was no acknowledgement or reference at all to, to, and it'd just be interesting in your interpretation of how that would be interpreted outside the European Union by, um, by, by people in the US and um, in the UK. <clears throat> Thank you very much indeed, Brian. Anybody else? Um, Dan, we might come to you on this question about how much the European Union has really done for Ukraine. There does seem to be a lot of confusion about this, whether it's military support on the one hand, largely, of course, by member states, and the financial support provided bilaterally and by the European Union. How do we assess this after almost 600 days of war, do you think? Well, certainly from, from various sources I've seen, the, 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 you know, there may be some difficulty in assessing this, but that the EU collectively has given as much military support uh, as the United States collectively. Now, I'm not a military expert in you know, how those figures are compiled. Um, but, you know, um, to Brian's point, like I did make that point earlier that the US, I think I was corrected, the US was mentioned once in the entire speech. I think that's clearly a mistake. And certainly from sitting in Dublin, where transatlantic relationship is so important um, that that you know that there was not greater mention about the importance of the European US relationship uh, I think was it was a serious error and won't go down well in the US um, amongst those people who pay attention to the to, to, to these things um, with the UK I don't think the UK was mentioned once uh, again clearly the tensions between Dublin and London at the moment are 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 high um uh and i think you know catherine i'm sure has a has the best insight into this but you know I, the, the, the sort of sense that britain is gone and there doesn't you know nobody in brussels really, really wants to sort of give britain credit for anything or sort of show it in a positive light is is uh is just a, a fact of life these days i want to just ask a hypothetical question if i could we can project ourselves forward more than a year. We have a US presidential election where the vote on the left splits and Donald J. Trump returns to the White House mm -hmm. after he has been convicted on just one of the 91 criminal charges that he's been indicted on. Um, how does the European Union deal with such a scenario, do you think? Lisa, and are people seriously thinking about this, that a Trump administration that, whether he's in prison or not, promises to be significantly more radical, because he believes he wasn't radical enough on a lot of issues, does it present a threat to the European Union, and why aren't people talking about it more? I think for a couple of reasons. Does it present a threat? Yes, but lots of things present a threat. And we've already had four years of Donald J. Trump, and we survived. And I think that the United States is bigger than any one person or any one president. And as we saw, he attempted to be a lot more radical, but was curtailed in his ambitions during that four year term because American democracy prevailed. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, we need to keep a watching brief on what is happening, but that shouldn't deter us from the path that we are on. And, um, you know, the, the US was mentioned, thankfully, in, once in a positive light in terms of um, uh, the critical raw materials and having that club, as was referred to. So there, is, there, there was talk about that, our relationship with the US and it being important. Uh, I take on board the points that Brian made that, you know, why didn't we mention the US or the UK in terms of Ukraine? But I, you know, the US involvement in, in supporting Ukraine is to their benefit too. So I don't think we need to be thanking them for, for what they're doing. They're not doing it out of the goodness of their own hearts. They're doing it because it's in their interest geopolitically to support Ukraine and to prevent Russia from, from succeeding uh, in, in, in taking Ukraine. So um, I think our, our relationship with the US will prevail and will always be strong. It's in both countries' interests to do so with the Union and the US. And we will just need to keep watching brief on what happens with the presidency. Mm -hmm. And it's been pretty good value they've spent just three and a half percent of their defense budget on supporting ukraine it's not as if it's been this incredible burden or anything like that no and it goes down well politically at home mm. it's it's, yeah. it's part of u.s foreign That's policy right. but i would also say the context of this speech it was a very inward looking speech this was a speech you heard the the reaction of the parliament when she made this faux pas and said honorable yes. member states even that wasn't mm -hmm. what they wanted to hear so she, of course she's speaking to wider than the people in the hemicycle but at the same time 
it's part of the European choreography of job changes and all the rest of it. So I'm not too surprised about that. And to her credit, I think she has done a lot to improve the EU relationship with the UK. Now she has uh, partners on now that she can do business with, so to speak. Um, and I, I wouldn't quite agree with Dan that nobody in Brussels wants to even mention the UK. I think um, the both the EU and the, the current government anyway in the UK acknowledge and want to have a closer relationship insofar as it's in mutual interest. And I think you will see that coming slowly. That does not mean that anybody is thinking of the UK rejoining anytime soon, but to have a more rational relationship between close neighbours and allies, I think, is something that both sides will be working towards and that I think she, if she is the next president of the commission, would be well able to do. Mm -hmm. And I agree with Lisa, um, we've seen Donald Trump before, we know what we would be dealing with now. If anything, I think it would accelerate parts of this agenda because we would realize that we can't rely on the United States under Donald Trump, so we have to do more ourselves. Dan, just, just, you know, I don't think that Donald Trump is a threat to the EU, it's, it's the NATO, it's the other pillar. Uh, in, in the European architecture, institutional architecture, if if the security guarantees, Article 5 security guarantees go, mm -hmm. everything changes in Europe overnight. So the entire security framework of Europe changes, and that 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 would just would have the most profound overnight effect on Europe, you know, arguably in the post-Cold War period. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have a question from Professor John O'Hagan from Trinity College. And he asks a question about enlargement and whether it's realistic to think that we can enlarge to 32, 35 states without changes to the operation of the veto. Mm. So what are the chances that we might be able to do that and persuade all member states that they should move to some kind of QMV, even in foreign policy issues, perhaps even a super qualified majority? There's an art. Yeah, it, we are actually having this debate. The size says everything. I know <laughs> because we had a conversation at my party thinking yesterday specifically on this with Barry Andrews and Billy Kelleher, our, our two MEPs. Uh, in the, the same thing when we enlarged 20 years ago, the same question was posed: Can we manage a bigger union with the same voting mechanism? And we did. Yeah. Um, we're not going to go beyond 30 anytime soon. We're, we're you know, it's still a number of years ahead. There is an argument, I think that the war in Ukraine certainly put it back on the table very firmly because do you have one country vetoing what is clearly the preference of the vast majority of EU citizens to take a particular action? So farm, the, the foreign policy area is certainly one where, but you know what will happen if it comes to a domestic referendum here mm -hmm. on, on that particular issue and the scaremongering that will happen. And so it, it needs to be a very clear ask and a very clear and defined reason that, you know, pros and cons, cost benefit analysis, this is the right thing to do. And acknowledging that there is, of course, a risk attached to adopting that particular policy, because it has served us in the past and other member states will, will have particular histories as well. So it would be a very, very difficult sell for us here domestically, and I suspect in other countries as well. But as the president pointed out, if and when it is needed, we can discuss it then. It's not really on the table right now. Yeah. I, I would agree. I mean, I think the question will be posed um, inevitably because it will be, she talked about the capacity to act and that is what the EU has to protect. It has to be able to act. Um, what I would foresee perhaps is a shrunken veto, mm -hmm. like a very limited area and very strict circumstances under which a veto could be applied. I think that could be the compromise that could emerge, exactly how you would design it will take an awful lot of discussion. But I think um, we, we, with the whole sanctions issue, and even with Poland and Hungary, how to deal with them, and, and the, the, the treaty has been a progression of, unfortunately, how do you deal with member states who don't want to play the game? Once upon a time, just for an opening, an infringement proceeding against a member state was shock horror, and they immediately came into line that they have to be fined after not uh, respecting court rulings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When Article 7 was put in the treaty, 
no, it, it was to apply to one member state that would be so far out of line. Nobody ever imagined that you would have two member states backing each other and effectively nullifying Article 7. So each time uh, reality shows you that perhaps uh, the, the members of the club don't behave quite as well as you would like, and you have to bring something else in. But we've always found a way to do that. And so I think rather than, you know, outright uh, dumping all the vetoes, it might be possible to have a, a super narrowly defined veto which would then help everybody to feel well look in the end of the end of the end if I really need to do it I can yeah. but would have to be much more justified and with all kinds of constraints attached to it. One final question prompted by what Lisa said about um, a possibility of a new referendum at some point in the future but this also applies to the European Parliament elections next year some democratic theorists are absolutely terrified about the potential changes that artificial intelligence is going to make to political campaigns, whether they are elections at national and European level or referendums. Mm -hmm. That, you know, two to three years from now, the capacity of AI to interfere and to matter in the context of malign actors who want to do things to disrupt and damage the European Union or individual uh, jurisdictions. Are we really taking this seriously enough, Lisa? Or is there any talk within political parties about yeah. how this might be managed? Yeah, we are very concerned about this. Um, it's, it's part now of our conversations with other colleagues across parties. We were discussing it. My own Facebook account was hacked last week, mm -hmm. uh, paid for and sponsored ads disseminated across the country um, and thankfully you know what the content was minor enough I was quite relieved that it wasn't something of a, a more serious nature but I think that the, the era of deep fakes um, you know where videos can be put out that look as though you're saying something that you're not saying and the impact of that depending on how close it is to polling day could be catastrophic so it is it's already happening it will impact on our elections can we prevent those things from from being out there I don't think we can actually but I think informing the public to be more critical of what you see, analyze more closely what you see, don't trust immediately what you see. The article circulated purporting to be from me last week had the RT branding on it, a trusted news source, the, the most trusted news source in the country, which then prompted RT to issue a statement on it. So it is, it's really concerning for us as public representatives, political parties. We have no idea how to deal with it. Um, we don't have the toolbox to deal with it. And, and I do think there is an onus now on on the state and all states to really inform the public that this stuff is here and it's and it's it, it will be part of the next election yeah yeah there were two occasions over the summer where i met you know two people separately they were people with advanced master's degrees and the extraordinary amount of misinformation that they had taken on the lines that they were spouting were straight out of propaganda channels that are familiar to mm -hmm. us and they didn't even seem to realize this. And you know, the argument is if people with that level of education are falling for all of this, it makes the task of holding elections and referendums that much more difficult in the near future. Yeah. And determined to send you home on a very positive <laughs> note. <laughs> see, you can see I'm geeing myself up for the new academic term as well, laid <laughs> down by problems. I'm going to bring this morning's panel to a close. I want to thank <laughs> sincerely Barbara Nolan from the European Commission representation, Alex White and his colleagues from the IIEA. And most of all, in addition to our audience, both here and online, can I thank our speakers, Lisa Chambers, Catherine Day, and Dan O'Brien. Thanks, Bill.